Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dean Lorenzo. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Foley. I want to echo um, Dean D. Lorenzo's congratulations to each and every one of you, uh, to your families, to your significant others, your partners, your husbands and wives, your kids if you have them, your moms and dads, your grandmothers and grandfathers, relatives and friends, every single person here tonight and as part of your support structure uh, that is here and is so very proud of you and has helped you on this journey. Um, I am honored and, and humbled by this privilege to, to be able to address you uh, tonight on your graduation evening. Uh, I want to thank Dean DiLorenzo and Vice Chancellor Foley and our President John Sexton for granting me the signal privilege of being a member of this incredible university and this incredible school. Um, it is such an incredible opportunity for me at this point in my career. Um, many of you have come here from very far away. Some of you have been separated from your families and loved ones for the time you've been here. Others live close by, come from this region, come from this city. Um, regardless of where you live, I'm well aware of the sacrifices and choices you've made. I want to remind you what a tremendous privilege it is to receive a higher education and how fortunate each and every one of you, each and every one of us, is to be able to get this kind of education from this incredible institution. Each and every one of you and your families have made the biggest and best investment you can. It's in your education and your skills in what economists like me call your human capital. It is by far and away the most important and longest paying investment you can make. At more than that, you've benefited by the great university you've chosen to study in and that's embraced you, but by living and studying with in the greatest city on the face of the planet, a diverse city, a city of arts, of culture, and ideas, a city whose energy is in its people, its creative ferment is felt by all who have the privilege of being in it. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my own journey and hopefully share some, some wisdom I've accumulated along the way. I'm astonished that I'm standing here before you. Um, I was not born in, into privilege. Like many of you, I come from very humble roots. Um, my grandparents came to this country from southern Italy about 100 years ago. All four of them were peasant farmers with zero education. My father, who was born in 1921, not too far from here in Newark, New Jersey, uh, made it to the seventh grade. And in the seventh grade, when he was 13 in the year 1934, he he asked his teacher if he could be excused, and he put his books down on his desk, and he went to the employment office. Imagine this at age 13, folks, uh, because he had to get a job in Newark to help support his family. It took nine family members, my granddad, my grandma, my father, his brother, and his six sisters to support that family. My dad then enlisted in the U.S. Army. He fought in all the great battles of World War II. Uh, and he came back from the war. He met my mom in the park in Newark, uh, ice skating one day. Uh, they got married, and he had two boys. He, they gave us great Italian names, Richard and Robert. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't speak Italian in the house. They didn't allow us to speak Italian. They wanted something better in their words, in, in their world for their children. Um, they were education parents. Uh, they sacrificed everything for their kids and they, they moved to a suburb not far from, from Newark. It's called North Arlington, New Jersey. I don't know if you've seen it, exit 15W, uh, near the Giants Stadium. <laughs> they put us in Catholic school, which alone built character. I was taught by the ladies, are, uh, the, the sisters of St. Joseph. I have scars on both hands to prove it. Um, but our football team, our basketball team, and our sports teams were dubbed the Queen's Men. That builds even more character. Um, the smartest kids I ever met in my life, I met there. Very few of us got out. Um, 
the smartest ki people I'd ever met were back in Newark and North Arlington, Italian kids, African American kids, Jewish American kids, Irish American kids, Polish, I can go on. And, and, and I was lucky, I had parents who invested in me and my brother. They did something very dumb because my dad never had an instrument and he loved big band music and jazz music. They bought me an electric guitar and my brother a drum kit and it was my salvation playing rock and roll music. In our band, I would shake the fork and spoon that was on the wall, off the wall, but that's neither here nor there. And the turning point in my life, and, and Vice Chancellor Foley may get this, as a working class kid from New Jersey, I was granted a Garden State Scholarship to Rutgers College. It pulled me out of a terribly dangerous, dysfunctional, crime-ridden peer group and opened up a world of opportunity that changed my life. Uh, from there, well, well, interestingly, I'll, I'll tell you about that. I, I, I went to college a, a through and through working class kid. And I grew up, if, if you don't know Newark or North Arlington, that, that area, uh, it's like a combination of the Jersey Shore and the Soprano. So I grew up talking like this. It's really nice to be with you all here today, you know, in New York University, and it's a beautiful place. I swear that scholarship got me to learn English as a second language. Um, to graduate school, I went off to MIT and then Columbia, and I've now spent nearly three, three decades teaching at Ohio State, at Carnegie Mellon University, at Harvard, at George Mason, working at the Brookings Institution, the University of Toronto, and what an amazing privilege it is for me to come home. I, I never thought I'd be standing on a stage at New York University. It is mind-boggling, and, and it tells me what, if I could do it, if I could do it, someone who really learned, had to learn English, to speak English correctly, had to learn how to dress, had to learn how to cut my hair in college, didn't know the difference between a work shirt and a dress shirt. If I could do it and I could get out and I can achieve this, each and every one of you with the investment and the resources and the love and support, you can do it too. So let me tell you some of the things I've learned, not only from the school of great universities, but the school of hard knocks. First and foremost, never let a single opportunity pass you by. I never did, and I think that's what my parents taught me and growing up in New Jersey taught me. If an opportunity comes by your way, especially now, go for it. And you never know where that opportunity is going to come. You never know where that call is going to come, but be ready for it. Secondly, guys, everyone tells you you should focus, focus, focus. My, my parents told me, Richard, you have to be a doctor. Then they had an Italian intervention. No, you have to be a dentist. They called in all the cousins. I convinced them I was going to be a lawyer. They left me alone. <laughs> but what I did was spread my bets very widely. And like any good venture capitalist or any good musician writing a lot of songs or anyone working in sports, if you spread your bets widely and you make a lot of bets, one or two of them might pay off. Dennis mentioned I had a best-selling book. I had nearly 10 others that didn't sell at all. But the one bet of the 10 paid off. Don't be afraid to take chances, especially at your age, guys. This is the time when you can take chances, you can reinvent yourself. And embrace failure. My wife tells me the story of the woman all the time. My wife's writing a book on this of the woman who created Spanx, whose, whose dad, you've probably heard the story, but she tells me the story every day, whose dad said every day, come home, because my parents, I had to get straight A's. She's a Jordanian, she had to get straight A's. Whose dad said, what did you fail at today? Tell me what you failed at. Fail, but fail fast and recover quickly. Be resilient. Resilient is the most important characteristic. You know what Frank Sinatra says, you can knock me down, but then I'm gonna get back up on my feet. The most successful people in any endeavor I've encountered are the ones who don't let failure keep them down, the ones who rebound quickly. The other thing, especially after four years or more of study, you know what your best compass is? It's your gut and your intuition. It took me two decades to learn that. But when I began to, instead of look scientifically or rationally, when I began to listen to my inner self, my gut and my intuition, that's when I began to write things that resonated with people. But one of the things your academic training has prepared you for is you can test those intuitions. You can put those intuitions to the test like they're great hypotheses that you're going to collect data and evidence through your everyday activities to prove. Most of all, stay true to yourselves and to your dreams and to your passions. I cannot tell you how many students I encounter 
three or four or five years after school, who said, Rich, I, I took a job because I thought it was the right job for me because they offered me more money. And Lord knows we need to make money, all of us. But I thought it was the profession that I needed to go into, but it wasn't me. I've lost track of myself. I have students come to my office in tears. How do I get back to my purpose, my passion? Never, that's one thing I can tell you I did. Cities and communities and towns and recovering towns were my passion. I stayed true to them and I made a career out of them and I was happy every single day doing it. Now, what about your future and the challenges you're going to encounter? It's something I study a great deal and it's what my research is out. You know, I hear the naysayers. I read the New York Times. I read the Wall Street Journal, I read the Daily News, I read the New York Post, especially page six. Uh, I hear the naysayers out there who are telling you it's a terrible time to graduate college, the, the sky's falling in, we're all up to debt and up to our eyeballs. It's the best debt, if you have that debt, it's the best debt you'll ever take. Oh, the economy's uncertain and what's happening, don't buy it. You have the biggest asset in this economy money can buy. You have a college degree. Look, I know the struggles of working people. I saw what happened to my dad when the factory doors shuttered and he had to take a job in a health club on Route 3 in New Jersey. I saw what my mom had to do taking ads at the Star Ledger newspaper. When those rates of unemployment for working people skied above 10%, the rate of unemployment for a college grad never touched 4%. But there's a bigger point. You're graduating at one of the greatest times in all of economic history because it's a time of tremendous economic transformation. The great economist Joseph Schumpeter calls these times of economic transformation like we're going through, not crises, but periods of creative destruction. Yes, they are times of dislocation and stress where the future seems uncertain, but they are the times of the greatest opportunity career-wise, socially, culturally, and economically. And we are shifting through one of the greatest shifts of all history, as you know, because we're shifting from the old industrial age that my dad worked in factory age to a new knowledge age, an age which I call the creative age. You are part of a new class I gave a name for. I call you the creative class, where it's no longer raw materials or great industrial corporations, but your mind itself that is the means of production. You're going to face challenges in your career and life, but you're well prepared. Here's a challenge for you and an opportunity. My dad had Two jobs in his entire life. One job in the factory and the job in the health club when he was dislocated. The average person your age, the average person your age changes jobs almost once every three years. My parents lived in one house in North Arlington, New Jersey. From the time they got married and they both died in that house. I've moved 20 times in my career. It's not a career like my dad had with one job. A career today is a continuous process of ongoing development. It's a series of learning experiences, not a series of steps up a ladder. That makes things harder in some ways. It means you have to manage your life and your career. But what an opportunity. What an opportunity for growth throughout your entire life. I can honestly tell you my life has been one singular learning experience. Now, as you get older, you're going to have to manage people. Some of you already do. And I want to tell you one of the challenges of management. You can't manage people by giving orders anymore. The great management theorist, Peter Drucker, who taught at NYU, said the key to managing and succeeding in our knowledge and creative age is not to treat people like employees, but to treat people you come in contact with and you work with as volunteers. People will always want to make a living, but there's more than money. People want to find meaning and purpose. They want to be part of something bigger. Our rewards that we value are not extrinsic. They don't come from the outside. All of us who are in this creative class, whether we work in sports management or in hospitality, whatever our field, whether we're musicians or artists or intellectuals, our passions come from within. Look around you at your class. Look at the diversity of this group of people. From this great region, from every corner of the world, my class at Rutgers was all kids from New Jersey. What an incredible opportunity to be part. I taught in Abu Dhabi. 
this past January, my students came from every corner of the world. It's not because we're just diverse, it's because in a creative economy, in a knowledge economy, our creativity, our minds, our knowledge are the great leveler. It defies and obliterates the social categories we have imposed on ourselves. The creative age defies gender. Creativity comes equally in boys and girls, men and women. It's indifferent to race and ethnicity. It demands that all of us contribute and successful organizations like this great university demands that we're open to the diverse experiences and backgrounds of all. But most of all, it demands that we contribute. I noticed in both Vice Chancellor Foley and Dean DiLorenzo's remarks, they said this is a home for you, but we also have obligations to this university, to the places we grew up, in my case, Newark and in New Jersey and others, to give back. We not only have opportunities, we have obligations. And I can tell you this from my heart, because I was one of the lucky ones who got out. We have a special obligation in this society when the salaries of college graduates are two to three times those of those who don't complete high school, when the unemployment rate is 4% for you guys and 15 or 20% for your friends or colleagues or people you know who didn't graduate high school, where the jobs like my dad had in a factory don't exist anymore for less skilled people. We have an obligation to give back to those people and places that are being left behind in this great economic transformation. And I want you to think about that as you move forward in your careers. Maybe not tomorrow, certainly not tonight, but as you move forward in your careers, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Not only what has been invested in you and given to you, but the obligation you now have as graduates and as young adults to give back. You see, you're not just going to follow your own dreams and build your own careers. It's imperative, given all that your families, your university, your society has invested in you, that you give back. That you help others realize their dreams, too. The mark of a truly great person, when all is said and done, is not only that they develop and utilize our own talents, but we develop and utilize the talents of others. That's what a great university, that's what a great community, that's what a great society is all about. That's the challenge of our time. That's the challenge of this creative age. That's our great opportunity. That's the challenge of your generation. Not just to get ahead, but to work to cultivate the talents of others, to help build great communities under truly great society. You know, that's the challenge that this school, this incredible school at this incredible university has prepared you for. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Embrace this day and take your next steps on what will be an incredible journey.